Hi, my name is Stephanie Hertz, Marketing Director here at Warwick Forest Retirement Community. Warwick Forest is the premier sponsor of the Lifelong Learning Society, and we welcome you to the Riverside Lecture Series. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing two wonderful speakers. The first is Dr. Teresa McConaughey. Teresa arrived at Riverside over 30 years ago to train in family medicine and join the faculty of the Family Medicine Residency for five years. She practiced family medicine within Riverside Health System for 20 years until she moved into the community to provide home-based medical care. She continues to enjoy teaching as part of her medical practice. Dr. McConaughey is passionate about meeting people where they live and providing person-centered care. She now practices home-based palliative medicine and has an additional role as Riverside Hospice Medical Director. Listening to her patients tell stories is the center of her practice and allows for a discussion of beliefs, values, and goals. She believes that these are what should guide each of us in healthcare to provide medical care that aligns with the patient's goals for their personal medical journey. In her downtime, she enjoys gardening, baking, kayaking, and camping. Today with Dr. McConaughey, we also welcome Beth Widmeyer, Riverside's Palliative Care Services Director. Beth started her relationship with Riverside Health System when she went to nursing school in 2001. Through nursing school, she worked as a nursing assistant, and then after graduation from Riverside School of Nursing, she worked as an RN in the ICU as a nurse navigator at the Cancer Center and at Riverside Regional Hospital as part of the palliative care team. Beth has a passion for helping patients and families understand their illnesses and the choices they face related to healthcare. She has a Bachelor's of Arts in, from Virginia Wesleyan University, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Virginia Commonwealth University, and is currently working on a Master's Degree in Palliative Care from the University of Maryland. Beth lives in Seaford with her husband and two dogs where she loves spending time outside with family and friends. Please help me to welcome Dr. Teresa McConaughey and Beth Widmeyer. That's great, that was nice. All right. So now I wanted to, let's see, work the AV again. There we go. I wanted to start by telling a little bit of a story today. This is my dad. If you can't tell, I kind of favor him a bit. Um, <laughs> his name was William. We called him Bill, William Keith Widmeyer. He was born February 27th, 1939, excuse me, uh, in Greeley, Colorado. That's where I grew up as well. He worked for his dad. They always called it the garage, but it turns out back in the day that the garage was attached to the um, Chevy dealership that they had. So he would say he worked at a garage, but it was a bit more than that at the time. Um, and then also on the family farm. He went into the US Army, which he always told me was to get away from a girl. I still don't know if that was the real story or not, um, but that was his character. He would joke a lot. And he married my mom, Mary Louise. So I always joke that William and Mary um, was in my family, even though I never went there. He had my sister and my, uh, my sister and myself, and my sister has two boys. So he has two grandsons who were quite important to him. And he became a certified um, CPA, CPA. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having, having a moment. Um, so I want just to tell you a little bit about who he was. And knowing that he was a CPA is really important. Knowing that he was a certified public accountant um, plays into things when we start talking about planning, planning for our future. So this is my family. Um, and my dad worked very hard, especially what he called during what we called tax season, right? We're in the midst of that right now. Um, if you haven't done your taxes, you better get them done. I think that's this weekend. Uh, <laughs> and we always knew that he was working hard because he was investing in our family. And being able to work hard, he would then play hard. We would have family vacations. We had a, a cabin up in the mountains that we would spend almost every weekend as a family at. 
And most importantly, we had all of that time together. My dad invested himself into our family and took care of us better than I could have ever asked for. Although his financial investment was easily seen, the investments in our family that were most impactful were the conversations that we had during those hikes, during the weekends up in the mountains or on vacations, or the way that he could just say, I'm really disappointed in you, and you knew you had really messed up. So his girls were everything to him in taking care of us. We always knew where dad was on certain issues and the same thing and knew everything that was important to him. The time and conversations he invested on us were um, the most amazing value, had the most amazing value uh, we could have ever asked for. So in June, 2021, COVID, remember that horrible period where we weren't allowed to leave our houses and it was quite horrible. My parents who were always on the go, towards the end of COVID, June, 2021, it was wrapping down and my parents were itching to get out of the house, to go on a vacation, but they weren't really quite ready to make a big travel move yet. So I said, okay, there's rentals down in Outer Banks. Why don't you all fly from Colorado into Norfolk? We'll go down to Outer Banks rent an apartment or a condo where we can cook. You don't have to go out in public as much, but we can be at the beach, spend that precious time together. And, um, and so they thought that was a good idea. So my husband and I packed up the truck, headed down to Norfolk, picked up my parents and got on the road to Outer Banks. Well, my mom is always interested in what is going on at work for me. Um, and so at the time I was working at the hospital, doing consults for palliative care in the hospital. Palliative care is an extra layer of support for patients and families, helping them understand what their disease process is, what their choices for their care are, and especially in the hospital, helping them understand what some of those decisions and the impact that they may have on them might be. So I started telling my mom about this one patient I had. They were in the, in the ICU, had been in the ICU for about 12 days on a ventilator, hooked up to machines and medications. And I had been working with this family and the family was struggling. It was coming time that they needed to make a decision. They were kind of at a crossroads. So my role was to support them, educate them on those options for the crossroads. One of the questions I always ask my patient's families, if the patient couldn't speak for themselves, was what would your loved one tell me they want if they could sit here with us and speak to me? And this wife started crying when I asked that question. And she said, you know what? My husband would never talk about this. This was off limits. We could never talk about it. I don't know what my husband would choose. Well, remember, I'm telling this story to my mom. And my mom immediately starts hitting my dad in the front seat. Bill, Bill, we've talked about this, right, Bill? We know what each other wants. And my dad, being my dad, turns around and goes, yep, it's all planned for. It's in the blue notebook and turns back around, right? He didn't really want anything to do with that conversation at that time because he was going on vacation. But we did then continue to have a conversation on our way down to Outer Banks about how they have good faith in God. They believe they'd had good lives. And if their time came, they're okay with that. And they didn't want to be hooked up to machines or different things. So, of course, my husband was just listening to music because he didn't want to be a part of this conversation <laughs> either, right? So, anyhow, we had the conversation on the way down to the Outer Banks. And this is a picture of my dad. Um, and his little silly cap, I called it his Gilligan hat that he always wore. Um, and he sat there and watched the waves lap because I think it might've been a nor'easter or something when we decided to go down. So the weather was not as beautiful as I had hoped, but we weren't sitting at home. So a few days later, my dad ended up in the hospital down there in Outer Banks. And my dad had a lot of chronic diseases. He had leukemia, he had heart disease, his heart didn't function well at all. He had kidney disease, I learned, that he didn't tell us about. 
Um, and there were many other things going on with my dad. And he had kind of gotten to a point that we couldn't fix things anymore. We were just trying to make him as comfortable as possible. He had started looking really, really good. And we were trying to plan a way for him to get back to Colorado and do rehab. Um, but then it came a time in that hospitalization that we had to have those conversations with his care team. We knew dad didn't want extreme measures. He had a full understanding of what his medical conditions were. And when we were sitting and talking and I said, dad, this is the time we need to talk about those things. He said, blue notebook, it's all in the blue notebook, right? <laughs> I said, well, dad, we don't have the blue notebook. You're gonna have to talk to us. Um, and finally it came out that he didn't want resuscitation. He didn't wanna try any procedures. And unfortunately, my dad didn't make it back to Colorado alive, but we knew what his wishes were. And as much as I know he wanted to die in Colorado, I also know we met his wishes. So this is, my parents were snowbirds um, for several years. They would go from Colorado to Arizona. Um, and there was one year, 2012, that I actually got to go to Denver for a palliative care uh, conference. And my dad said, oh, well, I'll fly up from Arizona to go skiing with you. So he was, I think, 79, 70. I could do the math. But anyhow, he was not a young chicken when he was doing this with me. Um, but it was really important that we had that experience. Um, and it was really important that we had had those discussions. Even on the way down to the Outer Banks, I had no clue that my dad was going to pass away on that trip. But knowing that we had had those conversations and he had invested that time in our family to talk about the things that mattered to him made all the difference. So the blue notebook, anybody wonder what the blue notebook was? Well, it not only had his advance directive in it, but it also had everything financial that we could have ever asked for. My mom didn't have to hunt and peck for a daggone thing. And there also was a letter too, it said, just mom on there. I still don't know what that letter said. So investing that time and those conversations are gonna make all the difference. Oh, you don't need I don't. I use the clicker. Oh. Okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what Beth's dad was able to put in place for the family and for himself. Um, and so a question people ask was, well, you know, is there, is there a way to do this that makes sense? Is there a rational way to walk through these steps and really um, put a plan in place or create a plan? And I think there are three steps to this. One of them is really understanding um, your own medical conditions, your um, situation, and then talking to your medical team, your providers, whoever's involved in your care about what the future of your medical care could possibly look like. So that's step one. Step two, um, I think it's really reflecting on your own beliefs, values, and goals. Um, we all have our own um, ideas about what we want our future to look like in terms of our healthcare. And I think if you um, spend some time doing some own, you know, insightful thought processes, you can probably come up with things that are important to you, things that matter to you, things that you would not want to live without, or um, outcomes that would be unacceptable to you when you start thinking about them. And the third thing is um, really talking to your loved ones about that, whether it's friends, family, whoever it is that is important in your life, you need to share that information. So we're going to talk a little bit about each one of these. So what does your medical journey look like? <clears throat> this is a really, I don't know if you, I hope you guys can see this okay, but this is a um, really just kind of an illustration of different kinds of medical conditions and what the trajectory of those illnesses may look like. 
Um, and I put this up, I, when I talk to patients about prognosis, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, this is a nice um, picture to kind of uh, allow people to think about what their disease may look like as it goes further and further along. Um, and, and the top one, as you can see, is, is sort of a, um, we're doing fine, we're doing fine, and then we're not doing fine. Um, that's what we see oftentimes with cancer. Um, so if someone has an advanced cancer illness, we can talk about what things may occur and what that progression of the disease may look like. So the second or the middle graph really is, is a chronic disease, chronic heart and lung disease picture. So folks who have um, chronic heart and lung disease will often have repeated hospitalizations where they will have a flare-up of those illnesses. And so they'll have a dip in how well they're doing. They'll have more symptoms. They'll be less functional. They'll be able to, um, to take less care, less well care of themselves. Um, and those dips in care will happen. And People may come back up to almost where they were before the dip, but they may never quite get back to their baseline. Um, as someone gets further and further along in that illness, those dips get closer and closer together. The third graph is the less well-defined, if you will. It's kind of a squiggly line that trends downward. And that's what we see in folks who have dementia. Um, and really, there are not defined events most of the time, like there is with the heart and lung disease. People will sort of have little things happen along the way that cause them to be less and less functional over time as the, as the disease progresses. Um, so I, I show these to you so that you can have an idea that there is a trajectory for many of the things that um, we deal with in terms of chronic disease and talking to your medical providers and asking questions about what your particular situation or conditions might look like in a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Obviously, we can't predict the future, but we have information about what these illnesses um, look like and what those trends may be for you in these individuals. All right, so what, what about the reflection part? A lot of people say, this is the hardest part. You know, I, I don't know what's important to me. I don't know what I want. I don't know what I want my future to look like. But I think um, talking to your family and um, asking them uh, those questions like, um, you know, uh, if you see me in a situation and that situation is something that I'm not comfortable with, you know, let me know that. And so having those conversations with your own family, friends, people who know you well, um, and asking their opinion about things will also allow you to have some insight into what's important. Um, there's a book. Um, called Being Mortal. If you've never read it, I think it's a wonderful um, opportunity to think through some of these things. And the author, Dr. Gwandi, um, asks two questions. One of them is, what does a good day look like? Um, another question he asks is, um, what are you willing to sacrifice to get more time? And often when we get to a situation where we're faced with our own mortality or we're faced with um, a chronic disease that is getting worse and worse, I think those two questions are very, very important um, to consider. Um, I have up there, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Um, many times we hear from families when we're having these discussions, I really wish mom and dad had talked to us about this before they got so sick. I really wish we knew what dad would say if he could talk to us at this time. 
So I do think that putting that plan in place turns this into something bigger and better than just those wishes for your family. Often Beth and I will say to our families, um, you know, uh, your dad gave you a gift by telling you ahead of time what it was that was important to him, what it was that he didn't want to happen to him, or what it was that he was not willing to sacrifice to gain some more time. So um, being able to talk to your family about these things is so important. So the last piece of this is the discussion or the conversation. Um, there are a few, um, there are, are a few things on the internet. One is called death on uh, death over dinner. Um, you know, I've had a few friends do this. I don't know if you've had anybody do this, but it's an interesting um, sort of premise. You invite family or friends over for dinner and you talk about these kinds of hard conversations. And, Yes, you have dinner and you have a glass of wine and you, you have these conversations. Um, there's also something called the Conversation Project, which is also out there. And it um, asks questions and promotes a conversation around what's important for each individual. And what's important to me may not be important to, to one of you or to each of you. So I think this is really that soul searching that you have to do to figure out how you want to spend your time when you get to that place in your life. Um, the last step is really sharing that with your family. Identifying a decision maker um, who you would want to make those, uh, to speak for you. So they're not making your decisions, they're representing you. They're, they're actually sort of speaking for you in that situation. Um, that's the gift, being able to talk to them ahead of time, give them that information about you, share that knowledge and that insight with them so that when you reach a place where you aren't able to speak or to spread that information, they can do that for you. Um, and I think that's the, that's the gift is, is being able to tell them. So as I started this and I said, we wanted to have a conversation, um, I really want you guys to ask questions, open it up. The audience member says that, um, you know, what do you do for those folks who, um, don't really want to have this conversation. They have a chronic illness. They live alone. They're, they have risk for um, complications or falling. It sounds like they don't want a medical alert device. Um, how, do you, how do you have this conversation with them? Um, and and I, I do think that is very, very challenging. Um, I think badgering them, and I'm not saying that, that that's what we do, but I think that's, that's the wrong approach. Um, I think um, being curious and asking questions about um, non-threatening things in that situation is better than making declarations. So, um, you know, how do you engage them in the thought process or the decision making around all of that? Um, and obviously each individual is going to be different, but I think people want to be autonomous and independent. We know that. Yeah. So we don't want to, we don't want to challenge their independence or, or their autonomy. We want to engage them in, in thinking through how they can continue to be as independent as possible. It yeah, makes that's, me. That's what I was going to say is that I find in those situations, it's frequently the very independent and I use stubborn, not in a negative connotation because I'm stubborn myself, but it's usually the very independent, stubborn people that want to maintain their autonomy to make their own choices. And I think one way um, that we can present that is this is a way that we will follow your wishes. We are empowering you to make these decisions um, and showing them that we don't want to take over your life. We don't want to take over your decisions. We just want you safe 
And if you want to stay in your home, we, we support that. We just want to do that safely and follow your wishes that way. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, unfortunately, sometimes you, what's the old saying? You can't, you can drink, uh, pull a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And one of the strong beliefs that I think Teresa and I both have is that all we can do in life is walk next to each other. We can't push them over. You, know? <laughs> you can't push their head under that water. Um, so just supporting them. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes that's the way that it does happen. Um, but letting them know, like Teresa said, uh, Dr. McConaughey said, not to badger them, but letting them know when you're ready to talk about this or ready for that support, we're here and we support you. And knowing you can put your head on your pillow at night that you've done truly all you can without, you don't wanna create bad relationships between you and that person either, because that's going to cause more problems down the road when they do accept uh, um, some help from you. I think um, one of the things I learned years and years ago was to try and use I statements instead of you statements when I'm talking to people about things that are hard. Um, so instead of saying you need to, um, as you just mentioned, I am worried, I am upset, I'm concerned, um, and, and put it on yourself instead of on them. So I think sometimes folks find better to that. There's a lot of you need to do that comes about when we start talking about folks who are losing functional abilities or are at risk of having harm. And we see that from the outside. Um, and we face that all the time when we're talking to folks who have chronic conditions, chronic illnesses that have put them in a situation where safety is at risk. We worry about that. So. But we all we want people to maintain their independence and autonomy as long as it So the flip side, yes, um, the um, audience member said, what do we do as an older person when we want to have the conversation, but our loved ones don't want to talk about it? So the opposite, yeah, um, and that, that we see that happen as well. You know, I think that's a, a fairly common thing because we don't want to admit that our, our parents or our grandparents are getting older and um, having um, having situations where things are changing and they're getting closer to end of life or uh, have being less functional. So I think um, again, same concept is um, asking questions uh, of the loved one and and asking them um, how they may be able to help you as a as an older person. Become, maintain your independence um, and, and asking them to become engaged in thinking through that. Um, and a lot of times people will say, oh, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna be fine. But I think the questions just need to continue to be asked. How am I going to be able to do this? Can I trust you? Can I count on you? Are there things that you can help me with as I um, start to have more and more difficulty? Yeah, um, another thing is uh, Dr. McConaughey mentioned that appointing that healthcare agent is very important, that that's the person that's going to speak for you. Um, and so in some situations I've seen where the daughter absolutely does not agree with the mom's choices or things like that, maybe that's a time when you talk to somebody else, unfortunately, and choose another healthcare agent and tell your family, hey, I'm I'm going to let your aunt be my healthcare agent because I know she can make some of these really hard decisions because some people aren't prepared and that's okay to have these hard conversations. So there are going to be situations where you're, you're not going to be able to talk to them about it. And that's okay because everybody's journey is different. You want to take that? <laughs> Five Wishes Project is um, a way of doing an advanced directive. Uh, they literally ask it in five wishes. I can't think of the exact five wishes, but um, one of the wishes is how I wanna be treated. 
how I want to be remembered. I'm looking at somebody in the audience because they may have a copy of. <laughs> um, but the Five Wishes Project was a way of starting these conversations that by asking somebody these five wishes, the end product is an advanced directive, a medical advanced directive. Um, it's things that one of the wishes is what I want my family to know as well. Um, so it's a good project in that it walks through these questions and can sometimes prompt really good conversations. Um, sometimes when people are very opinionated or know what they want though, when we're doing an advanced directive, we don't go through the full five wishes process because some of those questions they already know the answers to. So uh, we do use five wishes uh, in Riverside Health System for some people. Uh, like she, somebody has a copy of it. I'm not gonna be able to read that. <laughs> I've got my glasses on. So the five wishes are? Uh, the person I want to make care decisions for me when I cannot. So that healthcare agent, that's number one. Number two is the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want. Number three, how comfortable I want to be. Number four, how I want people to treat me. And number five, what I want my loved ones to know. Um, so those five questions are actually, they have um, subheadings under them. So they break that down into more questions. So those, those categories are the starting place. So it's a lot of questions and a lot of um, thoughtfulness, I think, required to complete this form. Um, so it, it is helpful. Uh, you know, I mentioned the reflection piece, you, that takes a lot of energy and effort and time. Well, this is, this is a prompt for the, the reflection. Actually. Yeah, and I think a lot of what we're talking about are things that you would want at end of life, treatments that you want if you're critically ill, um, mechanical ventilation, extra procedures, dialysis. Um, all of these things are things that are really easier to think about when we're healthy, when we're thinking about those values. Um, it's when we're faced with our own mortality that some of these questions become a little harder. Um, if we're faced with our own mortality and thinking about it for the very first time, we might be a little more scared and a little more apt to choose some of those things because we haven't thought about it. Um, you know, going back to my dad, I think about him, that picture of him skiing, wanting to go to the beach. He was a very active person. So even if we had not actually talked about some of the medical treatments, I could reflect on the kind of person that my dad is and know, or was, excuse me, and know that he would not want to be on a ventilator. He would not have wanted to be Oh my goodness, when we, I told you we were thinking about getting him back to Colorado for rehab, the idea of him in a rehab facility, he would have been the world's worst patient. He would have been trying to break out of there daily. So when Teresa, Dr. McConaughey is talking about those values and those wishes and what's important to you, is staying at home important to you? Is I, I joke, my parents were kind of polar opposites. My dad putting him in the facility, worst thing ever. My mom, if she can sit and watch TV and somebody's bringing her food, she might agree to that no matter what it is, right? And I'm not faulting her for that. I follow behind her a little bit in that way. But the values, what's important to you and what do you want that to look like in your future um, is what we're really talking about. And then of course, five wishes, going back to the question is one way of putting those thoughts and, and wishes into writing. Um, well, I think, yeah, um, uh, the question was um, when you, if you make the decision that you don't want interventions and you, you really want to focus on comfort, what's the best way to ensure that you're going to get that comfort? Um, and I, I think um, there's sort of multiple layers to that, to that answer. Um, one of them is, is really, uh, I think you need to have something in writing that says, these are the things that I do want and don't want. Um, I think you need to share that with your family because when you are in the healthcare system of the United States, 
Um, if you enter the door of a hospital, often the train leaves the station. And if you haven't had those discussions and had those conversations prior to the train leaving the station, the train never stops. Um, and so I think to ensure that you get what you want, you have to do it ahead of time, number one. Um, and, and then I think um, if your focus is comfort and you want to have a peaceful, dignified end, then I think hospice is part of that end of life care. Um, that's like another whole conversation. Um, but I think hospice is a comfort focused type of care. And I think if that's the goal that you have set for that time in your life, then, then that needs to be part of your, your care. And then if you have execute an advanced directive, that's going to appoint that healthcare agent that's going to speak for you if you're not able to. If you are lucid and speaking for yourself up until the time you pass away, that advanced directive never ever gets enacted. Um, but an advanced directive is gonna give guidance. If you hit the doors of that hospital and the train starts chugging away, but you say, wait a minute, I have my advanced directive. Um, you can say I want, and that's what we did with my dad. We wanted to try and get him to a better place than he was when we came into the hospital. But we knew that we weren't going to try a trial of dialysis. We weren't going to put him through another cardiac cath because I was able to pull up the one that he had had two months ago. So with his, had we had the advanced directive, but knowing his wishes, most importantly, we were able to at least put the brakes on that train. The train still rolled pretty darn fast, but knowing his wishes from our conversations and knowing that had they wanted us to produce an advanced directive, my sister could have somehow found the blue notebook and we could have gotten those advanced directives for him. So advanced directives, putting your writing and wishes, choosing the right healthcare um, agent, and then eventually towards the end of life, hospice will be the best way. I think Beth and I purposefully did not focus on filling out the documents. Um, we actually talked a lot about this when we were putting this together. And um, I think often everyone sort of says, well, you need to complete the advanced directive. And while we believe that's important, I think the more important part of this is actually thinking, reflecting, and talking about this. It's the conversation that's really the most important piece of this, not the document. So. Yeah, and my going back again to my story, my sister was still in Colorado. Um, so I was facilitating all of this back and forth, but my sister had also had the conversations. So knowing that we didn't have to go find the document, that we had had the conversations, we knew dad's values. Um, did she like that she wasn't here? No, absolutely not. I didn't like that she wasn't here. She's the oldest one. She's supposed to do that stuff. But um, knowing that we had those conversations as a family, invaluable, invaluable. So the question is, could we talk about the process of families choosing hospice care? Um, so uh, I guess in the context, I, I will use, uh, I'll use cancer as a, uh, an example, because I think the process is different depending on what the illness may be and where people are at the time they choose. So sometimes people are in the hospital, sometimes they're at home, sometimes they're in a nursing facility. So it, it, that process looks a little bit different. Um, a lot of times people will refer to reaching a place in their illness and starting to think about hospice and folks will refer to that as I'm ready to give up. Um, Beth and I cringe inside when we hear that, um, but I think um, we try to reframe that statement because giving up is um, very negative. Um, and I think um, this is a journey, right? 
it, this whole life thing we're on, this whole life and death thing we're doing, because we're all going to be there. Um, but I think when you think about uh, the journey, this there, there are stages and phases of this journey. Um, so to think about this as giving up sort of sounds very finite. Um, when in reality, we're kind of switching tracks back to our train analogy. We're kind of switching tracks a little bit and we're getting on a different track. Um, and that track is really focused on um, how do I live as well as I can for whatever time I have remaining. Um, and that may mean um, managing whatever pain or symptoms I may have. It may mean that I stop some medicines because they are no longer benefiting me. For example, in that cancer patient, maybe we're no longer going to do this, this chemotherapy or this radiation therapy because we've exhausted that and it's not not providing the benefit that we want. Um, so we're, we're choosing the comfort focused track as opposed to the disease focused track. And I wanna live as well as I can. I wanna be with my family. I wanna be at home. And that's the track that I wanna be on. So that's sort of the big picture conceptual part of this. Um, the actual nuts and bolts of choosing hospice is really um, talking to a medical provider and saying, you know, we're, we really want to focus on comfort for mom or for myself. That's what I want. Um, I'd really like to get hospice involved in my care. Hospice is a team. It's a team of uh, interdisciplinary team. So it's uh, physicians, nurses, home health aides, social workers, bereavement counselors, spiritual counselors. So there is a whole team of people who are involved in that care focused on helping you live as well as you can. Should you have a blue book? What? Should you send it to your children? Actually, I think that that would be a great idea. Um, you know, my sister and I only verbally knew what was in my dad's blue book. Um, we assumed we did anyhow from our conversations. Uh, then my mother, her grief was so great that even though the blue book was right where dad always told us where the blue notebook was, she had no clue what she was looking for. I think having more people know about those things, um, the better. Also, you know, keeping that information where it's accessible. I've heard of people that say, oh, well, my advanced directive or my important documents are in my social security or my what are safe, the safe deposit box. And I'm thinking, all right, well, nobody else can access that. That doesn't do us a whole lot of good. So I think your children should know your what's in your blue notebook. Um, and also, I think it's beautiful that my dad put a note just to my mom. So, yeah. Any other questions? Guys, good question from everyone. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you very much. Everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah.